Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Critical Care Nurse. Today we're going to be going over roles and positions during a, wait for it, code, ah! just kidding. Now a code can be a very stressful and nerve wracking event and the only way to get better is to actually experience them. More often than not, the more of them that you are in, the easier they become and the more relaxed you will be during them. Now that being said, knowing the different key roles and positions to fill during a code is a great first step in understanding how they work and being an effective and productive part of one. Let's get started. So now we're going to be going over each of the different um, roles and positions uh, during the code. So um, first and foremost, um, the first most important person would be the individual um, who initiated compressions. And now uh, with the compressions, we're gonna be going two inches deep. We're gonna try to do 100 beats per minute. We're gonna definitely want full recoil. And the two songs that people, most people sing are Another One Bites the Dust, popularized by Queen, and also Staying Alive, done by the Bee Gees. So now, um, times that are appropriate to do compressions are if a patient is uh, an asystole, an EKG flatline, they PEA arrest, so um, V-fib, V-tact, or SODs. So for here we would uh, verify off of the A-line um, if we can't feel a pulse, and also if we can't get uh, blood pressure. And another time that it would be appropriate to do compressions would be if a patient is um, having hypotension. Um, so around systolics 40s, diastolics in the 20s, maps in the 30s. Now, uh, position number two would be airway oxygenation and ventilation person. So if the patient is vented, um, we're going to hit 100% on the FiO2. We're going to try to hit 10 to 12 breaths per minute. And then uh, if we're bagging, uh, like I said, uh, we're going to run it at 100% and we'll be bagging uh, with a mask if they're not intubated um, through the endotracheal tube or the trach. Now more often than not the nurses are going to be there first so a nurse will be taking this position but ideally once a RT gets there they're going to continue on and um, take the role. <coughs> so um, position number three is the person that's uh, running to grab the crash cart um, now with the crash cart we're going to have our uh, defibrillator and we're going to have to put the pads on, connect it, open up the controls and shock. Um, it'll be either be, uh, there'll be a shock advised or you can just um, shock to whatever jewels you want to set. And usually more often than not when the docs come around uh, one of the MDs will actually take over that since um, they have to kind of run the code and then you know pressing the button isn't entirely or extremely time intensive. Um, now with the crash car too we're gonna have someone um, grabbing the rescue meds so things like epi, vaso, amio, lido, bicarb, and calcium. Now the nurses will usually do this at first but then eventually when pharmacy comes by once the code is initiated um, they will take over getting all these medications ready for us. There will also be a nurse, and this is usually going to be the primary nurse who is in charge of medication administration. Um, so in terms of uh, drips, we're going to and uh, we're going to want to use the largest access. So if they have a swan, we're going to want to uh, use the big arm on the MAC cordis or of the cordis, just depending. Um, so we're going to want the large access, we want a dedicated line, we want the, and if there is a VIP with all the adrenergic agonists, um, we're going to be using that too. Now one thing that I would say for the person doing the medication administration is that you are going to want to just grab um, a bucket, a uh, dump bucket. So um, sometimes we, uh, when you give medications, um, yeah, th those can pile up pretty fast. So we would want to have a dump bucket so we kind of keep track of how much we've given um, roughly. 
Now, position number five would be in-room supplies. So this will be a nurse who will be standing by the drawers, grabbing flushes, syringes, needles, IV tubing, and also spiking drips, uh, bags, and blood. Um, um, position number six, blood and fluid um, resuscitation. So for this person, they what I usually like to do is um, get one of four channels ready on an Alaris and I'll have all my blood tubing ready. If it's a level one, I'll have all the supplies ready and set for that. And also pressure bags. Um, and this is another position where a dump bucket is also uh, indicated because um, sometimes you're giving blood because um, you know with a level one um, with a big arm of a Mac you could seriously run about a liter in about a minute and, a minute and 20 seconds so that's really fast so sometimes when these things are blasting in especially if you have a huge access like uh, the big arm on the Mac um, you're not going to be able to really count during the administration more so afterwards so that's something too and the one thing that I love about the um, channels and the pressure bags too is that uh, it's pretty fast and you can kind of get it set up and the problem is the level one actually takes a little bit of time to uh, set up. Now position number seven will be the out of room runner. So This person is going to be grabbing like lab supplies, uh, fluid, blood, um, pumps or whatever other supplies um, that will be needed in the room. And then number eight will be the recorder. So sometimes the recorder, um, all the stuff is going to kind of be with a crash cart, but the recorder will probably be usually be the last um, person, just because we usually need bodies doing things, and even if we don't get our timing, we can kind of get a somewhat um, accurate time, but we really need to get um, things moving and um, be doing interventions for the patient. So once again, in terms of the different um, roles and positions, we're going to have someone doing compressions and initiating compressions, then someone uh, managing the airway. First, it'll be a nurse, and then it'll be an RT eventually. Um, with the crash cart, we got the defibrillator and the rescue meds, and then the MD will take over, and then pharmacy will take over as well. In terms of medication administration and drips, this is usually going to be the um, primary nurse because they know the patient the best, they know where all the access is, and you don't have to ask, oh, where, what line can I use, like which things are compatible. The primary nurse will already know, and they should be at the head of the bed. Um, then in-room supplies, and then blood and fluid resuscitation, out-of-room runner, and then once again, the recorder. So these aren't like the hard and fast like rules, like, you know, set in stone, like these are the only eight positions because there could be other... Um, people in between um, getting things set but for the most part these are all the things that um, are going to be important and need to be covered during the code. Now I'm going to touch on a few very important things to remember during a code. One of them is that there's always going to be something to do whether it is um, shuttling medications to the medic um, to the med pushing nurse or grabbing IV tubing or fluid and handing it to the person working the rapid transfuser or the IV pumps, or even just popping flushes and um, making them ready for the medication uh, administration nurse. Uh, another thing that you can do is even just cleaning up the garbage, or if there is spent bicarb or calcium or blood tubing, um, put that in the already administered uh, medication or um, blood product um, bucket that I usually like to keep at the foot of the bed. That way um, we can keep track of how much was given because sometimes it's just so fast we're pushing so many things and it's e I really really um, advocate for putting that bucket near the foot of the bed so everyone knows okay you know we gave six amps of bicarb, we gave three amps of calcium and this much epi, vaso, amio, etc. Um, another thing to remember is that a code is a very fluid um, event and you have to be able to adapt to your patient's ever-changing condition and also the resources at your disposal. And by resources, I mean um, people. So nurses, respiratory therapists, doctors. Um, you know, I was recently in a code where I... Before the respiratory therapist came, I was bagging uh, at 
Um, but then during pulse checks, I was also checking pulses. And then I was also handing off medications to the medication administration nurse and making sure flushes were ready too for that person. Uh, the reason being is the room was very cramped. We had CVVH, we had nitric, we had the uh, crash cart in there. And there was just a lot of people and a lot of space was being taken up. So I had to do multiple roles. And it's important to be able to know each role very well. Um, that way you'll be able to um, very easily and um, seamlessly move through the different positions and to the different positions to make sure that you're continuing to be an effective and productive uh, member of a code. Now the worst thing that you can possibly do in a code is freeze. Now I've only seen this two times and they were um, nurses from the floor who were actually on ICU orientation and when everything um, started happening it was just too much information or it's just too much going on and they froze in which case I had to like gently grab them by the shoulders and kind of like usher them to the side so um, people could fill in the spots that needed to be filled. Um, now with any stressful or emergent situation there are the three F's that can happen. It's fight, flight, or freeze. And for that uh, the freezing part was just probably the worst thing that um, you can do because you are preventing the team from giving timely um, efficient and effective care. Um, so there's no really easy way to prevent that from happening because sometimes it might just happen. And once again, the only way that you can get better at codes is if you actually experience them. And you know, if it's like your first code and you don't actually want to get in there um, and actually do something or take one of the roles, I would say just stand in a corner and watch what the doctors, what the nurses, and what the respiratory th uh, respiratory therapists are doing, um, so that you know maybe the second or third time that it happens, you can almost mimic and do exactly what you saw, because being very active in your first code is very rare, um, because usually the first code is something that it's just so shocking and jarring that you're not going to be able to actually function so once again if it's the first code and there's a lot of people there best just to step back watch and see how other people are doing it that way you can kind of internalize it of what you saw and then eventually um, do it um, later on down the line thank you for watching I hope I was able to help in some way, shape, or form, and if I did, please subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching The Critical Care Nurse. Let's save some lives.